The name of the sermon is Fearless Trust. Open your Bibles if you're following along. I'll be putting up the scriptures, but if you'd like to follow along in your Bible, Psalm 27, pretty much where we'll be for the entire, uh, entire lesson. <clears throat> As a minister, um, 45 years I've been doing this, 45 years. My job has brought me into people's lives when they are either extremely happy or extremely sad. For example, performing weddings is great to participate in one of the most joyful moments in a, in a family's life. Of course, on the other hand, I've received calls in a single week from members telling me they've just received news that they have cancer or perhaps a parent has died or a child has been in a car wreck. Ministry, as many of you who are in ministry know, is a kind of a emotional roller coaster ride as you go from high to low several times in one day at times. Happiness, you know, is, is easy to share. My role, of course, is usually to help celebrate and offer praise to God for the blessing of the moment. Trouble and tragedy are a little tougher because there's usually less to say and nothing much that you can do when people are extremely ill or have just lost a loved one. I've often said, you know, uh, for you, uh, the members, uh, the wedding, the high or the illness or the losing of a loved one, the low, may be taking place you know, one time and uh, then nothing happens for six months. But if you're in ministry, you, you may go through that high and low three or four times in the same week as you follow the congregation's uh, moments of happiness and, and sadness. Thankfully, however, God knew that we would experience both good and bad things in life. And he has provided words to help us celebrate as well as mourn uh, all of those times, good and bad. And so in Psalm 27, uh, David provides an example of the kind of attitude that a believer should have when facing, in particular, when facing difficult moments. This attitude can be summarized in one word, trust. David in this Psalm, however, describes the many facets of trust that a true child of God should have because of his or her relationship with God. There are many facets of trust, many ideas that people have about trust. Not all are accurate. Some people have the wrong idea of trust. They think that trust is, you know, crossing your fingers, you know, oh, everything goes okay. You don't knock on wood, you know, please don't ever say that if you're a child of God, don't ever say knock on wood, you know, that doesn't do anything. But they think that's trust. Or it's a type of resignation. Oh, well, you know, we have no choice. We might as well pray, it can't hurt. <laughs> that's not trust. And then, Blind faith and optimism, almost as bad as knocking on wood. You know, uh, I'm watching movies sometimes and somebody will say to somebody else, oh, it'll all work out okay. I promise, trust me. Oh, when I, when I hear somebody say that, it'll all be all right, just trust me. At least if he said, trust God, <laughs> but they say, trust me. And I'm talking back to the, I'm, I'm, I'm at that age and I talk back to the television and I say, you know, anyways, we won't go off on that tangent. Sticking to the sermon, David shows in his prayer that real trust, true trust in God has much more noble and specific qualities than just knocking on wood and saying, trust me, I promise, empty promises. So the kind of trust that we have in God that David describes, first of all, Trust is fearless. No fear in the trust that one has with God. David explains this in the first couple of verses. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? 
When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. In the first few verses here, David gives reasons why he is not afraid of putting his trust in the Lord. Because the Lord is the one who enlightens David. The Lord is the one who gives him understanding. The Lord is the one who will ultimately save his soul. And so David compares the damage that his enemies can do to him against the ultimate power of the Lord. And he concludes that there's nothing to be afraid of. Of course, his point is that God has given him the ability to understand that his enemies can only harm him physically. That's the worst they can do. The disease can only uh, harm the body. The evil one can only at worst take your, take your life and then only sometimes. However, David understood his soul, however, was safe with God. It was out of reach of his enemies. So he has trust, fearless trust in God. Some are brave only when they are in a, a superior position or they're winning the battle. But David is fearless even when he is outnumbered because no enemy can remove what is most precious to him and that is his soul and his salvation. Trust is fearless when it can stand before great enemies and not blink and yet know what John says. You are from God, or Jesus says in John, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We need to commit that scripture to memory when we have those moments, when we are afraid that the future will be too difficult, that the disease will be too powerful, that our enemies will overtake us, where the world is just too hard, it's just too much. We need to remember this passage of scripture, the one who is in us is greater than AI, it's greater than the electric automobile. It's greater than the big corporations. It's greater than the junk they put in our food. It's greater than, you know. It, there's an entire industry in our society that has only one goal, to make us afraid. To make us afraid so that they can sell us something. But he who is in us, is greater than all of these things. We can be sick, we can get beat up, we can lose our job, we can make a bad investment, lose our money, we can, you know, we can have all these things. But no one can take away the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, no one. We should never be afraid. Another thing about trust that David says is that it is joyful. Trust is fearless, trust is joyful, it should be. Let's read. He says, one thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple, for in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle, in the secret place of his tent. He will hide me, he will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. A trust in God that is fatalistic or doubtful is not really trust in God. If, if your trust in God is really trust in God, it will be full of joy, it'll be full of praise. David speaks with confident anticipation of the final victory 
that he will eventually have. And it leads him to praise God who will provide it. He says uh, that through his trouble, he has remained close to God by worshiping him and meditating on his word. And this experience has focused his attention away from his problems and onto the Lord. The result is a grateful and joyful spirit of praise. You see, in times of trouble and tragedy, the first thing we want to do is to go into a corner and hide. That's the natural thing we want to do. We don't want to talk to anyone. We want to be alone. We want to be away. We want to be in the dark. We want to retreat from the world and from the Lord as well or perhaps complain or blame or criticize him. But David does the complete opposite. He asks God to draw him closer to his side during these difficult times so that he can hide uh, him inside of God's dwelling place to allow him a more intimate knowledge of the Lord than he has had in the past. Uh, the thing that, that I have uh, gained in the last four years of decreased health. The one thing that has come out of that is that I have known the Lord more in these last four years than in the previous 40 years. Why? Because I needed him more. So I drew closer to him. I forgot that life is not about looking forward, what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna accomplish, what's gonna happen. Life is about looking at him, keeping my eyes focused on him. And sometimes difficult days help us to remember that and to do that. Here's where we see the link between suffering and joy Suffering causes us to trust God more and more because the greater our trust, the greater our vision and appreciation of God. The greater our understanding of God brings greater joy and desire to praise him. You see the link? David is saying, the worse things get, the closer I draw to God. The closer I draw to God, the more I get to know him. The more I get to know him, the more joy I have, the more confidence I have, the more fearless trust that I have, the more joy that I have. And then finally, he says, trust is fearless. It can become joyful and it is confident, confident. He says, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me nor forsaken me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. David, reviews his past experiences with the Lord. And he notes uh, the God has always answered, always helped, always saved him in one way or another. He says that his parents have left him, uh, probably meaning because they have passed away, but God will never leave him. He will always be there. We leave God, he never leaves us. When you say to yourself, it seems that God is not much in my life. It's not because he's left. It's because you're not in his life Amen. anymore. There's great comfort in the fact that the God we played our, uh, place our trust in is eternal and all powerful. We feel, you know, we feel confident if our bank account is solid, if our investments are in blue chip stocks, uh, the business is going good. We feel safe if our pension plan is with the government and our medical insurance is paid up. But banks and governments fail and insurance companies will drop you if you get too sick. 
David demonstrates that if our trust is in the Lord, it is surer than even the trust we have in our parents who are loyal and loving, but still weak and temporal. And so he provides a final encouragement. He says, teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries for false witnesses have risen against me and such as breathe out violence. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Final encouragement. Here, he describes the kind of trust that he has in the Lord and why. He has fearless trust because God protects what is most precious to us and that is our, our souls. He has joyful trust because trusting God leads to knowing and knowing God leads to joy and praise for God. And he has confident trust because God's care is more loyal and loving than even our parents' care. And so having encouraged his readers to trust God, David then leaves them with a, a final exhortation uh, about what to do in addition to trusting the Lord when they find themselves in times in trouble. He leaves them with two things and I uh, read uh, in 11 and 12, the first of which is enlightenment. In verse 11, <clears throat> in other words, he says, teach him how to deal with his enemies according to God's will. His human nature would just as soon destroy his enemies, but this may not be God's purpose or will. This is a good prayer for us to make concerning our troubles and our enemies. What do you want me to do, God? How should I act, God? Have you ever thought of that when you're sick? How should I be, Lord, when I'm sick? I know how to be when I'm happy. I know how to do that. I know how to do happy. I know how to do winning. I know how to do that winning. But how do I do losing? How do I do sick? How do I do old? How do I do that, Lord? Teach me. Give me enlightenment. God has a purpose for us even when we're suffering. And so we need to ask to know what it is, not just for the trouble to go away, because that's the prayer we always make. Oh God, make this thing go away. Oh God, you know, turn things around. Make me happy again. I, I, I've lost someone I love. Oh God, bring another person to love in my life. That's what we ask for. But we rarely ask, how do I handle this situation in a way that honors you, God, according to your will, so that I can draw from it the most uh, important spiritual lessons? And then the other encouragement that he gives is the idea of protection. This is a natural request. Uh, don't let them win over me, right? The enemies, the disease, the depression, the problems, you know, God saves the soul, yes, but he also can and does save the body at times. We know about King Hezekiah, he prayed for relief from his terminal illness and God granted him 15 more years of life. You know, read about that in 2 Kings chapter 20. We all die, but we can ask for relief from suffering and imminent death. God answers these prayers. In verse 13, David says that unless he had trusted the Lord in the way that he did and prayed in the way that he prayed, he would have fallen into despair. He's writing this Psalm about an episode that happened in his past and he's encouraging his readers to trust in God and ask God for what they need. He says that he did and things were so bad that unless he trusted and prayed in the way that he did, he would have fallen apart and given up. He ends the Psalm with a final word about what to do between the moment you decide to trust in the Lord and the moment that the Lord rewards that trust. Because 
Trust and prayer are not always answered on the same day that they're made. Therefore, while you wait, you know, you make the prayer, you have confidence in God, but then comes the waiting. What do you do while you wait for the prayer to be answered one way or another? Well, be patient. David says, wait on the Lord twice. Twice is not resignation or tapping your toe in a kind of impatience or whining or begrudging. When is this going to end? You know, that's not patience. This patience that he's talking about is a willingness to wait and endure whatever it takes to finally see the complete work of God in your life or the life of another person. That's patience. Sometimes the only thing you'll do in your entire life is plant a seed and the harvest will only come in old age or even in another lifetime. Waiting on the Lord is waiting with the knowledge that it will be right it will be complete, it will be acceptable when God is through with it, no matter how long it takes. And that's whether you're waiting on, on a plan or you're waiting on a child. Second thing he says while you wait, be strong, be courageous. This doesn't mean that the troubles and enemies don't frighten you. Fear is a natural human emotion, but despite this natural tendency, don't give in to doubt or loss of confidence or discouragement. You, know, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to win or have the solution to be brave. You need simply to refuse to give up or to compromise or be willing to accept the situation without losing faith. This is courage. I haven't got the answer and things are still difficult, but I am continuing to trust God. That's courage, that's faith. Brothers and sisters, oh, what a different kind of life we would have if we just trusted in the Lord each day for all our big and little things. Oh, what a different life we would have. Brothers and sisters, oh, what a church we would have if each member had fearless, joyful, confident trust in God who saves, God who provides, God who does great and mighty things. Brothers and sisters, let us each therefore make a decision right now that from now on we will trust, really trust God with everything and everyone in our lives. Oh, what a blessing awaits every person who leaves here this morning, having made that decision and that prayer. And then of course, if you need to go beyond that, if you need to finally answer his call to come forward in repentance and baptism, in order to properly obey the gospel or to come forward for prayer and restoration. Trust God to help you make the first step into the saving of your soul unto eternal life. Brothers and sisters, have courage and respond as we stand and as we sing a song of encouragement. Shall we do that now?